If you enjoy the Tudor Chess podcast, then perhaps you would consider becoming an official subscriber of the channel. From as little as £5 a month, official subscribers get access to a weekly bonus episode and additional content via Patreon. Just head to patreon.com forward slash the Tudor Chest or search for the podcast in Apple Podcasts. Dr Joanne Paul is a historian, author, broadcaster and former lecturer at Sussex University. She joins me today for a fascinating and at times amusing discussion all about the House of Dudley, the famous family for whom the Tower of London and the execution scaffold would loom large. From the hated Edmund Dudley, Henry VII's chief financial enforcer, to John Dudley, Duke of Northumberland, known to history as the key villain in the saga which placed Lady Jane Grey temporarily on the throne of England, to the charismatic great love of Queen Elizabeth I's life, Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester. This was a family who came from very humble stock, but who would rise to the very top of the Tudor nobility, witnessing up close all of the drama associated with this most infamous of royal dynasties. Welcome back to the Tudor Chess Podcast, episode 30, The House of Dudley with Dr. Joanne Paul. Welcome to the Tudor Chess Podcast, Dr. Joanne Paul. It's a real thrill to have you come on to the show. How are you doing? I'm all right. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Before we get into the the meat of the conversation today, which is about the House of Dudley and and the phenomenal book that you wrote about this iconic family, just a few questions just to get to know you a bit better. So can you provide us with a bit of an intro into your background, where you grew up and what you do full time? Sure. Uh, I was born in Canada. I am Canadian. Um, uh, I was was, born in... yeah. One, I was like, I think she's Canadian. I didn't want to, yeah. s- I mean, I knew North American, but I was yeah. like, I'm fairly certain that's a Canadian accent, not an American one. <laughs> well done. You're doing well so far. <laughs> um, yeah, I was born in Toronto um, and did my first two degrees uh, in history and politics in Canada and then did my PhD over here in the UK at Queen Mary University London uh, and I'm now on the uh, southeast coast, the Sussex coast, which is really lovely. Uh, I spent many years uh, in academia, higher education, um, and currently I'm an honorary senior lecturer at the University of Sussex, but I'm not teaching full time anymore. I've sort of jumped ship and am trying, <laughs> trying out the waters as a freelancer. Um, so I'm really I'm writing full time, which is kind of kind of the dream. Um, it's what I wanted to do when I was very young, and it took me a little while to kind of come back round to it. Uh, but I am really really loving it. What sparked your passion for the Tudor period? So was there something that sparked that? Uh, funnily enough, I think it was creative writing. I, I and and reading. Uh, my mom read to me a lot when I was very young, uh, Chronicles of Narnia, uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder, um, Anna Green Gables, Little Women, all of which actually are, are historical books in, in some ways. Um, and I think that really, it was fiction that really sparked my interest in history. And then from, from then I went to sort of more creative nonfiction and, and then properly the study of history. Uh, and as as a young person it was it was all sorts of history um i was very into egyptology for a while i think i still know the hieroglyphic alphabet um it was just the sort of this otherworldly past that that fascinated me uh but as as i went further in my education and especially at university it was the 16th century that always fascinated me there's something about that period 
where it's this real transition from the medieval to the modern. There are things that are recognizably modern and you can see how they'll develop into the things that we have today. But then there are things that are also completely foreign to us um, and have that air of sort of uh, chivalric romance about them. And I think it's it's that combination that I find really interesting. And from a sort of more intellectual perspective, um, this question of the path's not taken um, because it's this transitional period, it could have gone a completely different way. And, and that I find really interesting. If you could and this is a difficult question to ask any historian, but if you could pick a single moment from history to go back and witness, do you have one that immediately springs to mind? Probably not a particular sort of event or or moment, uh, but I'm I'm deeply interested in the sort of late 1520s, early 1530s, um, that sort of break with Rome period. It was also uh, the Renaissance um, was really making itself known in England at the time. Um, you know, I, I work quite a bit on figures from that period. I've written on Thomas More, for instance. Um, and just to see all of that play out, I think, would be, it would inform a lot of the questions <laughs> that I've always had. Um, and if I could keep my head through it, <laughs> um, I think I think I could learn a lot. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, no, this is pure. T- you get to time travel. You're there for a day. You get to jump back into the 21st century. So yeah, you got absolutely Some, somewhere in there. Pick, <laughs> pick, a, pick a day in there and, and uh, maybe somewhere around 1532 would be great. Yeah, I think it'd be fascinating as well to see that moment when Chapuis was forced to show some yeah. measure of deference to Anne Boleyn. That I think would be fascinating to see just everyone in the room and what they, you know, did everyone notice? What were they thinking? I think that would be an amazing thing to see. Yeah, I have I have another one related to Chapuis, but you're going to have to have me come back on because it's related to my next book project and I'm not allowed to talk about it yet. Um, so I, I will save that one and uh, you'll have to have me back. <laughs> Absolutely. So is there a Tudor misconception that you would love to change? Uh, well, I think we're going to talk about the Dudleys and the sort of the black legend of the Dudleys. Uh, obviously, um, there are some elements of that that I would love to see changed. Um, I got to know John Dudley, Duke of Northumberland, very well. And I think that there are some key misconceptions around him. But I think we'll come to that. If, if I had to pick the sort of the one that irks me day to day the most, um, it would be the presentation of Jane Seymour um, as as sort of this pure innocent um, when I really don't think she was, <laughs> I think, I think mm-hmm. you know, Anne Boleyn is is presented as the seductress, but you know they courted for for years and years and years. Whereas Jane Seymour comes in, she does essentially what Anne Boleyn already did, while Anne Boleyn is in danger of her life and everything else. And she, she yeah, I I think she um she she knew what she was about and is far more ambitious <laughs> and perhaps a little calculating than she's usually presented yeah. um so yeah I'd, I'd i'd be interested in countering that one so you very elegantly mentioned there that we are here to talk about the house of dudley uh, and the, the the basis of the conversation is very much around the book that you wrote the house of dudley so what inspired you to write a book about this particular family i mean they are they're a known commodity in the Tudor story, but I suppose they're not necessarily, they're not the sort of people that we we talk about all the time. Was that part of the draw, I suppose, to writing about this quite controversial and, and very important family? Yeah, I think you're right. They don't tend to take centre stage very often. Um, Robert, maybe, occasionally. Uh, I mean, next to Elizabeth. Um, but I mean... Edmund and John are, are barely ever represented on screen, for instance. Um, we, we just don't really hear from them. Uh, for me, it started uh, where the book starts, actually, with uh, Leicester's Commonwealth, which is this pamphlet that circulates uh, the Elizabethan court in the 1580s and lists all the scandals uh, and rumours associated with the Dudley family over three generations, uh, accuses them of, of raising their children to uh, be traitors and and to attempt to take over the throne and uh, i mean it, it, it accuses robert dudley of trying to kill someone with a salad of using an italian ointment 
to enhance his member, uh, very various things, um, and and obviously not all of it can be true. But of course, some of it is. They they did over three generations rise very high and and fall very hard. And um, mm. I I just remember looking at it and thinking. I mean, what is going on with this family, right? I, you know, this can't be right. But what is what is the culture of a family? Every family has a has a culture. What is the culture of a family that produces this? Um, what what was it like to be a member of of this family? Um, and so, I really set out to tell the story of of a family. Um, Edmund John and, and Robert end up being the kind of key characters that people are familiar with, but my intention very much was was to zoom out from them. Um, in particular, I talk about the women of the family as much as I am able to, uh, and uh, sort of jump from from point of view and, and, and the, the figures in the family to try to give a more comprehensive sort of holistic um, presentation of, of, of their story. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it, it was it was curiosity really. Um, what what happens in a family so that in every generation over the Tudor period, someone gets in touching distance of the throne and then is executed for treason? Yeah, because I mean there are three. It was also three generations of men who were beheaded, wasn't it? Because mm-hmm. you had Edmund, then you had John, then you had Guildford. Yeah. So it was a family who for whom the Tower of London loomed very large across, you know, huge swathes of their of their life. Yeah, there were very few members of the Dudley family who didn't end up in the Tower, imprisoned in the Tower at some point. <laughs> like, I'm having trouble coming up with many of them. Um, and, and not just accused, but convicted of, of treason. Um, you know, Robert Dudley is convicted of treason. Um, before before he goes on to have this career in, in the court of Elizabeth I. So, yeah, I, I just wanted to know what that family was like beyond the sort of black legend and the way in which we've been told to think about them. I wanted to get back to their actual letters, their actual experiences. Yes, I've, I've actually had a very similar um sort of experience with the book that I've written. So my first book comes out in July and it's about the rise and fall of the Pole family. Ah, congratulations. And That's and I also yeah, I yeah. can I can see similarities already. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and it's fascinating because again, we know Margaret Pole, we no Reginald, but really that's kind of it. Yeah. But there are huge similarities. We're talking about a family that again, it was only Ursula Pole that was never imprisoned. Mm-hmm. Um so very, very similar experience, I think, to, yeah. to what you've said. Oh, that'll be a fantastic book. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, thank you. I'm really <laughs> excited. It's coming yeah. out at the end of July. Well, make, so, make, sure, yeah. make sure I get a copy, please. Yeah. You'll get a copy. You'll get a signed <laughs> copy. Don't worry. Yes. <laughs> so to start with Edmund Dudley, the, the first sort of key member of the Dudley family, he rises to a position of considerable power during the reign of Henry VII, as a, a sort of a key financial administrator. So how did he come to that position? Because the Dudleys weren't, to the best of my knowledge, I mean, they became very ennobled later, but at this point, they were not members of the sort of the high nobility. Not at all. Not this strain of the Dudley family, anyway. Uh, there are the Barons Dudley, uh, which is sort of the elder line. Um, Edmund is descended. Uh, he's the eldest son of a younger son of a baron. So he is, he's a country gentleman at best, essentially. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's a trained lawyer. Uh, he is, it, it, by all accounts, a pretty good one, um, but sort of academic. Um, and, you know, I don't mean that in, in a pejorative way. I do have niche interests. <laughs> um, but he particularly knew these very archaic um, king's prerogative uh, um, laws that uh, shouldn't have made him very important but um henry the seventh at the time uh was feeling very precarious as the founder of of a dynasty that might end with him um his eldest son had died his queen had died he had only one young son also named henry and 
there had been decades and decades of warfare, civil warfare, and there was nothing that suggested that it wouldn't go back to that, really. Um, and so mm -hmm. he wanted to shore up his power. Um, and one of the ways he did that was by collecting as much coin as possible. And more than that, um, collecting obligations, um, making people in debt to him, um, tying them up in these these fin financial transactions that meant he he sort of owned them in some sense that that they 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 owed him something and he could control them that way. Um, and it just so happened that uh, Edmund Dudley was someone who knew how to do that very effectively because he had all this knowledge of the king's prerogative and these laws that could kind of be dusted off and and redeployed. How exactly? Uh, he came to Henry VII's attention. We don't know for sure. Um, almost certainly, though, it had to do with Henry VII's devoted uh, minister, Reginald Bray, <clears throat> who died um, shortly before we know that Edmund um, entered the king's service. Uh, and he, he uh, uh, Reginald Bray, seems to have had uh, some relationship with Edmund's father and so probably knew of him. So we can imagine that Reginald Bray, as he's dying, he wants to ensure that his work and the king's work continues and so suggests that Edmund Dudley might be the man who can help Henry VII. Uh, and he very much, very much was. Um, very, very quickly, he uh, sidesteps a, a promotion. He actually has to pay to get out of a promotion that would continue him on his legal path. And instead, he becomes Speaker of the House of Commons and very soon after is sworn into the council of the king and, and starts his work collecting money on behalf of the king. So the Edmund Dudley you're describing sounds like a complete forerunner of Thomas Cromwell in many respects. In some ways, that's true. I mean, Henry VII um, set up, set the groundwork very much for people like Cromwell and Wolsey and his son's reign. Um, there's this fantastic book um, by Stephen Gunn called Henry VII's New Men. And it talks about this very deliberate strategy on the part of Henry VII to pluck uh, men out of obscurity, essentially, who were from nothing, um, but were very well educated, fantastic administrators, great bureaucrats, um, and place them in positions that would have otherwise probably gone to nobility. Uh, and this did a couple of things for, for Henry VII. It meant that he had competent administrators, which the nobility were not. <laughs> um, they, they, were, they were not that good at it. Um, it also meant that he had men who were disposable. He could, he could lift them up and they owed him everything. And he could tear them down and there were few consequences to doing so. It wasn't you know, like executing a duke, for instance. Um, and, and thirdly, it gave the nobility someone else to hate other than him um, by fostering this, this discontent between these elevated, almost nouveau riche sort of um, administrators, the new men, uh, and the ancient nobility. He could sit above it all and just let them fight it out. Uh, so it was, it was a brilliant stratagem. And yeah, we, we see uh, Henry VIII doing very similar things with people like Wolsey and Cromwell and others. Um, I don't think that Edmund Dudley had anything like the administrative acumen of someone like Thomas Cromwell. Um, he, he was brilliant at it. Um, but in terms of, of this, this sort of career path and this elevation, um, certainly it's similar. It, it's also in some ways similar to the path of Thomas More. Um, both of them did uh, two years uh, at Oxford and then left early, not finishing their degree in order to study the law. And then fairly soon, soonish after, after sort of establishing a, a legal reputation, ended up in the service of the king. Um, and of course, both of them for both of them, it ends very badly. <laughs> uh, so I think I think we do miss uh, the precursors to those men whose names that we tend to know in Henry VIII's reign if we don't look at those of, of Henry the Seventh. You mentioned there that you know it was a good way of Henry the Seventh of Henry the Seventh having somebody that the nobility could hate, but Edmund Dudley was also 
very disliked by the common people, uh, to the, again, to the best of my knowledge. And one of the first acts that Henry VIII does when he becomes king is to order Edmund's execution. So what was it that that turned Edmund Dudley into such a figure of loathing for the, the sort of the common people of England? It was that he was very good at his job, <laughs> essentially, um, that he executed the king's will, sorry, that he executed the king's will so effectively in collecting the coin. Um, he used men of very dubious reputations to essentially browbeat people and um, to sway juries, often with threats and, and all sorts. Um, and he ruined people's lives, essentially, um, in trying to extract coin from them. I tell a story in the book um, about a haberdasher named Thomas Sonneth, um, who Edmund Dudley just hounds and hounds and hounds over the course of several years. Uh, they both actually end up in the tower at the same time, uh, Sonneth by, by Dudley's hand. Um, and that's just that is just the one story we know of. Um, we have Edmund Dudley's account books. Um, he he single handedly in in under four years uh, raises the income of the crown by over half. Um, and there are just names and names and names of people from whom he's extracted coin. And each one of those, there's probably a story much like that of of Thomas Sonneff of. Uh, people being beaten down sometimes literally um by mm. the agents of, of edmund dudley and edmund dudley acting very coldly towards them each time he is very much someone who doesn't bother making friends who isn't that concerned about his popularity he seems to have this sort of black and white view of things that it's the king's will he is an agent of the king's will Therefore, it, it has to happen. Um, and any pleas mm. um, like against that um, are, are just an irrelevance and almost an insult to him. He, he seems to have this bit of a chip on his shoulder um, about uh, his sort of his proximity to the king and, and the power that that gives him. So, yeah, w without question, very, very quickly, he becomes unpop uh, very unpopular. Uh, in particularly London, uh, but it spreads beyond that as well. And that in many ways leads to his downfall, because as you say, Henry VIII, when he comes to the throne, he, he lets Dudley's enemies uh, arrest him immediately. Uh, Edmund does spend uh, just over a year in the tower uh, before the order for his execution is given. But we think it's probably because Henry VIII goes on progress and really starts to understand how deeply unpopular Edmund Dudley is that he gives the order, he sends the order back for his execution. Uh, so it is probably that right. that vitriol really that is spread around about Edmund Dudley that is his ultimate undoing. So he's eventually beheaded uh, and with his execution, there's obviously an attainder. His son, John, John Dudley is very young at this age, at this time, I think he was about seven or eight um, when his father was executed, but he eventually grew to be a sort of consummate courtier. So he was very skilled in many of the activities that Henry VIII greatly favoured, like the tournament, um, you know, the tawny, archery and so on. How did he come, how did he go from being, you know, the son of a man executed and hated to being in, to, in the household of Henry VIII? This is where we have to look at the women of the Dudley family, because in 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 each case, each generation where there's there's these tragic falls, it's the women who often rebuild the family, uh, and I, this is very much the case when it comes to Edmund's fall and and John's rise. Uh, his mother, um, a woman named Elizabeth Gray, uh, was from a, a much more noble family than the Dudleys. Um, she was a sort of distant relation of Elizabeth Woodville, uh, who of course becomes uh, Ed Edward IV's queen. Uh, and so I think she knew how to play court politics much, much better than Edmund did. And uh, within just over a year of 
Edmund Dudley's execution. Um, and again, a tainter for treason, you know, it's not just his death, it's, 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 it's a huge scandal. Um, she manages to mm. marry the illegitimate uncle of the king, Arthur Plantagenet, who had helped to raise yep. Henry VIII, uh, who remained uh, at this point a close friend to, to Henry VIII, uh, and, and she marries him. Uh, and I think it's, it's that that allows the family, her children, back uh, into the king's good graces. Uh, so John is uh, uh, restored in blood. The, the, the stain of his father's treason is legally at least removed from him. And he's placed in the household of uh, Edward Guilford, who uh, is at this point the master of the king's armory. Uh, and he gives John that education in arms that serves him so well in, in the court of, of Henry VIII. Uh, and so as a young man, he is uh, he, he goes to war in France and is knighted. He returns um, and with various of, of, his, of his friends, young men like himself, is throwing some of these tournaments as well as participating in them. And yeah, Henry VIII loves it. <laughs> so he... By 1525, he marries. He marries Jane Guilford. And over the course of their marriage, they have a whopping 13 children, eight of whom are boys, which would have been the stuff of dreams for Henry VIII. So what was John Dudley like as a husband and father? I think one of the things that is often viewed is that he's a very harsh man, that you know, not particularly loving. But I believe that his relationship with his wife was actually incredibly strong and, and they had a good marriage best we can tell that's absolutely the case I, I mean you mentioned the 13 children you tend to stop after two or three if if the marriage is is not something you're both into um they 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 have far more children than is necessary strictly speaking um though of course tragically um most uh don't don't make it past the age of 25 um and and there's no hint ever of any kind of rumor or suggestion that there isn't anything but a, a, a loving, faithful relationship between the two of them. I mean, you think about John Dudley and all the things <laughs> that are said about him. At no point does anyone suggest um, that uh, they they don't have um, a very loyal marriage. Um, I think at one point there's some suggestion that he's going to cast off his wife to marry Elizabeth or, or something like that, but it, it, there's there's never really any suggestion. Um, we have some of of their letters which which indicate this. Um, there's a letter that they write together to their son, also named John, um, and and there's this sort of uh, John's writing it, and then there's this sort of sense in which he he passes it off off to Jane, like okay, now talk to your mother, <laughs> and she writes a little note in it as well, and. And um, when John, you know, and we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but when, when John himself is, is executed, um, or just before he's executed, Jane uh, refers to him as the most best gentleman ever living woman was matched with all. Um, and she's sick, physically sick to her stomach with the anxiety of, of what might happen to him as, as well as um, to her, her children. Uh, so there seems to be a, a truly loving relationship between them in her will. She's gifting things that belong to John. And I, I, I go on too long, but I, I think their relationship is, is a really beautiful one as well as being politically powerful. Um, they're this great Tudor power couple. Yeah. And a rarity, I think for the time for there to be, yeah. you know, for there to not be rumors for there to, the best of my knowledge, no sort of illegitimate children hanging around as well. Nope. This this is really rare for the time. Yeah, and I, I, it's worth remembering too. As I said, he grew up in the house of Edward Guilford, who was Jane Guilford's father. Mm. Um, so they had known each other as as children. They'd grown up together, and it is a uh, it would have been an expectation, uh, at least or at least an aim for uh, John. Edmund Guilford's ward to marry his daughter and sort of keep all everything together in 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 the family, um, and so they probably grew up knowing that 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 was to be uh, what was intended for them. But also, I think it speaks to the fact 
that they had this connection as as very very young people um a friendship i i, I suspect there was a friendship and a, a sense of alliance between them and as you say that is really rare for this time to see that so clearly where did the family sit when it came to their religious beliefs i think because of what ha- later happens with jane gray and the the desire to not allow the catholic mary to ascend the throne that we therefore assume that the, the the whole of the Dudley family were very sort of were lent very much towards the Protestant faith. Was that the case? I think, uh, yes. I, I mean, uh, at least it's very difficult, of course, to know um, people's personal beliefs um, unless they declare them. And even then um, it can be hard. What we can trace are their political allegiances. Uh, and certainly the Dudleys during the tumultuous break with Rome, um, those decades, are allying themselves with people like Anne Boleyn and Thomas Cromwell and the Seymours um, and and these these forces for reform, for religious reform within the English court. Uh, And as time goes on, uh, that becomes even more apparent. And we can also look at who their enemies were. And their enemies were the Howards, (laughs) um, uh, who, of course, were religiously conservative. Uh, the Dudleys do yeah. very, very well under Queens, Anne Boleyn, James Seymour, Anne of Cleves, Catherine Parr. Not so well under Catherine Howard, for instance. Um, so it, it it very much appears that they are aligning themselves with, with that reformist uh, movement at court action, if, if you like. Uh, and and later on, John Dudley will respond to accusations that he's a religious instrumentalist, um, that his his religion ebbs and flows uh, with with politics, and, and to say that no, he, he's always been what we would now call a, a Protestant. I, I will say though that that doesn't mean that they don't ally themselves with with Catholic forces at court, um, and in particular, one of the things I was really interested in in my research is how closely allied they were with the Lady Mary, Mary Tudor. Um, she's godmother mm. to several Dudley children. There are gifts exchanged between them. There are moments where uh, John is sort of sent to transport her from place to place um, as a friendly force. Uh, and considering what happens sort of down the line, I thought that that was very interesting. And also speaks to the fact that, yeah, I mean, mm. it, Factions is probably too strong a word, um, that it wasn't black or white in that way. So by the time that Henry VIII eventually dies, John Dudley is a central part of the Regency Council that's appointed to govern England during the the minority rule of Edward VI. So what roles had John Dudley performed sort of in the later years of Henry VIII's reign that got him to this position where he was viewed as a central part of the the next reigns uh, a central part of the council that would that would oversee the next reign essentially it had a lot to do with the military training that we were talking about he becomes known I suppose as a sort of safe pair of hands um when it comes to anything uh in terms of war or defense of the realm or the like. Um, It also uh, tends to flow from his connection to Edward Seymour. Um, They had been been friends uh, for a long time. They seem to have met as young men in France um, when they were both knighted and then participated in various tournaments together, um, various property transactions and and so on. Um, And Edward Seymour is uncle to the heir to the throne, who becomes Edward VI. And so he is always one step above Dudley in the chain, as, as he ought to be, really, with that sort of connection to the mm. to the crown. But every time he vacates a post, it tends to go to John Dudley. And we have some letters, at least, where Edward Seymour is recommending John Dudley for the for the post he's he's vacating. Uh, one of the most important of these is Lord Admiral um, John. In many ways, revolutionizes the English Navy in the few short years that he's Lord Admiral. Um, Speaking again of of these changes to Tudor bureaucracy in in these years, 
it had previously been the case that Lord, the position of Lord Admiral went to nobles as a sort of reward. Um, for instance, uh, the illegitimate son of Henry VIII is Lord Admiral for a, a period in the 1520s when I think he's about six years old. <laughs> um, so he's, yeah, I was going to say he was really young at the time, wasn't he? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he wasn't doing much with it. Um, whereas when John Dudley takes on the role, we see all sorts of administrative reforms that really set England on the path to be the global superpower <laughs> that we know it to be centuries later. Uh, and so these in these sorts of roles, John really proves himself um, as someone competent, um, faithful, loyal. Um, and, and there's this sort of no-nonsense about him Um, We also know from later reports that he had a real presence about him, um, a a sort of authority and and maybe even a bit of a threatening one. Um, And so I think those connections, that that history, that that military prowess, all of that prepares him for a very important position, as you say, in the court of Edward VI. So when he's... When Edward VI takes the throne and the Regency Council is set up, he's actually elevated to the peerage. He's made an earl. Um, was this was, was this quite sort of planned in advance, or was it some a way of again sort of solidifying the men's positions as senior members of the nobility? He actually had already been a member of the peerage previously because um, he was Viscount Lyle, um, which is a title that he inherits through his mother's line. Um, his, it was his stepfather Arthur Plantagenet who had been Viscount Lyle um, thanks to his the marriage to John's mother. Um, but he had uh, fallen out of favor with the king, uh, been imprisoned for a time. And then shortly, not long before uh, Henry VIII died, um, he was forgiven and was so relieved at having been forgiven that he dropped dead. <laughs> um, which John Dudley doesn't seem to mind in that. Uh, they hadn't gotten on for, for years and years at that point, And it meant that John became Viscount Lyle. Uh, so he 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 was already sort of on the ladder, but the the idea that he would rise any higher than that um, really only came about because of uh, Edward Seymour's place uh, in this Regency Council, and then ab- above that uh, as as Lord Protector. Um, there's no evidence that there was a sort of set plan or agreement, um, but certainly uh, it was in Seymour who became Duke of Somerset's. Um, uh, it was it was in his best interest to ensure that his allies were well rewarded, um, and John Dudley was one of his closest allies in in the court and the council. So we've mentioned you mentioned Edward Seymour a couple of times, and the fact that the two men were good friends, and you know that Edward Seymour would have been responsible for John Dudley's rise from an, a viscountcy into an earldom, but their relationship does eventually break down quite considerably. So what led to the breakdown of their relationship and how did John Dudley actually end up triumphing over Edward Seymour? Yeah, it, I had no idea when I started mapping out this book how far back their relationship went and how many decades of camaraderie there was between these two men. And a camaraderie... It's it's a brotherhood. They 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 treat each other as as brothers. I think um, for mm. for many many years, and so when that relationship does break down, uh, it's it's a real tragedy, um, and we can see this in some of the frustrated letters that John Dudley sends uh, around the time of of Seymour's fall, really almost angry at him um, for continuing the the actions, the behaviors that had led to his his downfall. Um, so Seymour becomes well makes himself <laughs> Lord Protector essentially um, and is is king in all but name, but then doesn't rule very well. Um, he fails to take the advice of, of the council and to to consult them properly. Uh, he mismanages the finances, various policies, um, it leads to a rebellion, which John Dudley, as sort of the, the realm's go-to commander, has to put down. 
Um, and so John participates in a sort of coup to, to overthrow Seymour, um, but he refuses to have him executed. Um, and there's this great scene that we get um, where the council is is considering uh, having Seymour put to death. And, and John, with his hand on the hilt of his sword, says, he that would have his blood would have mine also. And that sort of ends the discussion. Um, at least any official discussion of, of the execution of, of Seymour. But Seymour keeps pushing, keeps trying. Um, he's, he's let back into the council, but uh, John is just so frustrated that he seems to want to get back to his position of, of rule. Um, mm. uh, you know, John says in a letter at one point, you know, what, what, what thinks my Lord Somerset in this way um, when his, his, like governance is so misliked still, you know, when, when people are still so angry at him, why is he pushing his luck in this way? Um, and so eventually um, Seymour is uh, arrested and convicted and uh, charged with various treasons and felonies. He's not convicted of any treason. Um, he is convicted of, of felonies, however, for which the punishment uh, is death, including the, um, Compassing or or planning the death of John Dudley, um, and when presented with his charge, uh, Edmund said that he hadn't decided that he was going to try to kill his friend John Dudley, but he had considered it. <laughs> um, so it's clear that that there there was probably a plot against John um, from from Seymour, and so Seymour is is put to death, and, and John really becomes the leading man in the realm. So when Edward VI becomes gravely ill, he famously creates a new line of a new line of succession, his device for the succession as the documents known, which names Lady Jane Grey, John Dudley's daughter-in-law, as his nominated heir. Now history tells us time and again that John Dudley was almost like the sort of the grim reaper hanging over Edward, pulling the strings and effectively forcing Edward's hand. What are your feelings on this? I love that image. <laughs> I think, I think you've, you've, you've painted that very well. I think that very much is the image that we are often presented with. I think it's worth tweaking it <laughs> slightly and remembering uh, that Edward is essentially a young man at this point. You know, he's not an eight, nine-year-old. At, at this at this point, um, he's he's a teenager. Um, he very much knows his own mind. Um, if anyone feels like getting into Edward the Sixth's mind, I, I wouldn't recommend it. But he does keep a journal um, during his reign, and uh, he is definitely sure of himself. Um, as uh, read letters to his sister Mary as well. Um, he is not someone easily cowed. Um, so the idea that, you know, this young sick boy is being manipulated um, by the evil Duke doesn't quite hold up. Um, we also don't know the timings of things. Um, we know that Jane Grey becomes Jane Dudley um, by marrying Guilford Dudley, John's son, uh, in May of that year. Um, the device for the succession may have already been written in some form before that. We, we don't know. Um, so the sequence of events is, is difficult to determine. The other thing that I'd say is that from Edward's point of view, the device was a really good idea um, because he does skip over essentially three people in giving the, the crown to, to Jane. Um, and those, those people are his elder half-sister, Mary, who's Catholic, um, so she she gotta go. Um, his his still elder, but the younger of the two, a half sister Elizabeth, um, who Edward would be pretty confident is is Protestant. Um, so there's questions about why he skips over her, and then he skips over Jane's mother, Frances, who's definitely Protestant as well. And I think what is often lost in in telling this story is. Yes, their religion is part of the motivation for this, but what he's looking for is a man. <laughs> he's looking for a male heir, and none of those women were likely to produce a male heir. 
Uh, Mary yeah. and Elizabeth weren't married, um, so and and it would be difficult to negotiate their marriages in a hurry. And Francis was almost certainly past any childbearing years, had had three daughters and hadn't given birth in 10 years. Um, Jane was married or about to be married. A young woman could already be pregnant with a son. Um, and so I think Edward is trying to find the fastest route to a Dudley, or to, to, to an heir. Now that heir might have been a Dudley heir. <laughs> and then that's, that's where John may have had something to do with at least the planning around that all important marriage but it the device made sense to to edward i think edward is also a character that we you know we were discussing earlier about tudor misconceptions and i think as a whole edward is a there is a just huge misconceptions about him and i've said before that i think that he he showed all the signs of growing up to be even more of a tyrant than his father would have than his father was yeah he's he's for for all you game of thrones people out there he's a bit of a joffrey joffrey yeah <laughs> um <laughs> i i actually and and i think um unfortunately it was on the, it was cancelled after only one season but the becoming elizabeth tv series i i think that they were doing a good job of, of setting that up in in edward um you know that that, that yeah. he would turn on people very quickly um and that he he definitely he saw himself as chosen by God, um, as as a, as a as a new Josiah, as as this um, figure who would who would bring about the religious redemption of the country, um, and was an absolute zealot about it. So I I hundred mm-hmm. percent agree. Um, and by the time he's dying, again he's not a, a child anymore. Um, he's very much a young man and had started picking up the reins of, of power already um, and and was chomping at the bit to, to do even more. I loved Becoming Elizabeth. I was really disappointed when it wasn't renewed for a second season. I thought it was so good, although I do think it should have been called Becoming Mary because I thought that... Uh, yes, oh, she oh, was she, amazing. I mean, finally, finally a portrayal of Mary that does yeah. her justice uh, and that wasn't a one-note sort of yeah. caricature. I just thought that Romola Gari was, she stole the show. I mean, every time she was on screen, I was just glued. I thought she was incredible. Well, and and, and there was a, a John Godley, who I think was presented fantastically, you know, um, a military presence, charismatic, this ally relationship with Edward Seymour, um, and he, he he too he wasn't a caricature, you know. Um, it, w- it would be interesting to see where they took him, um, but he was endearing, uh, and I think that that speaks more to what John Dudley was like, uh, at least at the beginning of the reign. He's definitely viewed as a bit of a villain, which I think is is an in part created by by f- fiction and, and films like Lady Jane from 1986, for example. Having spent so much time in his company, what do you actually think of him? Uh, it, it's it's difficult um, because, as you say, you spend so much time with someone. He was the first person in, in writing this book where I'd, I'd really gone from their birth straight through to their death. and And was able to follow him very, very closely throughout his life. Um, and so it's hard not to become sort of attached. And um, I, I don't mind admitting that I, I cried when I, I wrote his his death um, in, in the House of Dudley. That being said, um, I try not to fall into, um, you could call it a trap or, or whatever, of um, becoming too attached and, and having sort of favorites and, you know, defending them to the death and, you know, all of that sort of thing. I, I, I think that that um, can be dangerous to the historical project. Uh, that, that all being said, and, and with some attempt at object, objectivity and an admission of my own subjectivity, I, I think he certainly wasn't what he's painted to be. Um, he was probably ambitious. God knows they all were. Um, I think yeah. more than anything, he wanted to protect his family and his family name. Um, 
I think he ended up on uh, this sort of hamster wheel um, where the higher he he went up, um, the further the fall and the high, the only protection was to keep going higher and higher and higher. Um, and he made a lot of mistakes, but most of those mistakes actually came from a place of, of mercy. His, his greatest pitfall, we, t- we talked about um, Edmund Dudley and his sort of his fatal flaw being uh, his, his unpopularity and his, his disinterest in doing anything to make friends. Um, John Dudley has a very different one. Um, he tended too much, I think, to forgive people. Um, he would find people <laughs> up the wazoo and then release them to seek their revenge on him, <laughs> essentially. Um, <clears throat> and you see that, uh, for instance, with Pitts Allen, Earl of Arundel, um, who really plays a pivotal role in, in bringing John Dudley down. You see him do it with Seymour too, right? He tries to have him rehabilitated and then Seymour plots to kill him. Yeah. Um, so actually it's, it's his mercy um, in some ways that uh, becomes a problem for him. Uh, there's some great letters that I was able to work with where um, not long before it all goes down in the succession crisis, 1553, um, where he's really weighing up the price of serving the king and whether he'd rather just retire to the country. And he's, he is in the country at the time. He's, he's ill or feigning illness. Um, and, and he decides in the end to, to go back to court and to serve. And I think part of it is performance, of course, although he's writing to a sort of lesser person at the time. Um, but I think there is this sense of service in, in John. I think he is trying to serve, the crown um edward the sixth says it's jane it's jane happens to be his daughter-in-law all the better <laughs> um and then you know when when he's accused then of of treason he says well i was serving the queen the queen was jane i was doing what i was told by the people who are are judging him at that time um so he ends up you know i, I think very much a victim and I, I might get some emails for saying that. <laughs> no, but I think it's it's very similar. I suppose what you're it's almost like Occam's theory of you know that mm. the simplest uh, explanation is often the right one. And with this, I mean, I was talking to somebody a little while ago about Jane Boleyn by Countess Rochford, and we were saying, you know, what on earth led her to do what she did with Catherine Howard? And I said, well, she probably she was doing what she was told to do by the Queen. You know, and I think that that's, again, something we kind of tend to forget is that she was a servant to the Queen and she was probably just doing what she was told. So it's, and and we sort of tend to forget that, I think. Yeah, I get the question. I get the question all the time. Um, Did did, did John really think that the reign of Queen Jane would work? Or, Or some variation of that question. And it's worth remembering that even Mary, Lady Mary's allies. Yeah, the Spanish ambassador said yes, you've got no hope, right? No hope, right? Yeah. Um, you've either got to surrender or flee. Those are your options. Um, facing the military might of, of John Dudley and the council, there was no way she was going to take back the throne. Now, it turned out they vastly underestimated her. Um, but no one thought at the time that it was possible. We have the benefit or perhaps the the disadvantage of hindsight that we know that she was able to take back the throne and very quickly and relatively easily. No, that was a complete surprise <laughs> to everyone living in 1553. Uh, and, and there was nothing really... It was obviously very controversial what what Edward did, and legally it was iffy. Um, but he was king; he could do things like that. Um, and especially if if Jane had turned out to be pregnant um, and given birth to a male heir, right? I, I people would have preferred her to marry 
Um, a lot of people would have preferred her to marry anyway. Um, and, and, and so John, I think, is only a villain or a fool with that hindsight. So obviously Jane Grey's reign is very short-lived. It collapses and John Dudley is captured by Queen Mary's forces. During his imprisonment, so before he's executed, he converts back to the Catholic faith, which we're told Jane Grey, his daughter-in-law, is furious about. Do you think that this was just pure lip service to Queen Mary in the hope that it might spare his life? It's important to remember that this conversion takes place on the day that John was scheduled to be executed and he's executed the next day. So I think it makes it very difficult to see it as an attempt to save his own life um, because it is it is right before his execution. It's on the day he's meant to have originally to have been executed. Um, it is absolutely lip service to the queen. Um, he gives a scaffold speech that says all sorts of things about you know the error of his ways and the true religion of catholicism and and all of that and mary has it printed and distributed um which is very very clever uh and so it's a brilliant pr swoop um for for mary um and and john participates willingly i i it's just really really hard to imagine he thought that it would save his own skin it, uh, we have to remember that all of his sons are imprisoned in the tower. Um, and also, uh, are they accused of treason at this point? Convicted? I think they've already been convicted. In any case, the axe is hanging over them. Oh, I think he does it for them. Yeah. And I think that's the deal. Um, which completely, I think, if, if we buy that, and I think there's all sorts of reasons we should, completely changes how we understand that conversion um because john, john did believe in the reformed faith I, he, he as lord president of the king's council he he participated uh he led um much of edward's reformation um and so for him to so publicly his last act right on on the earth to publicly mm. renounce that faith in favor of Catholicism, the embarrassment of that as well, um, and to do it in the service of the queen who is killing him, to do that, though, in the hopes of saving his sons is, is actually tragically admirable. So, very sadly, John Dudley is not the only member of the Dudley family who is executed. His son, Guilford, follows in his father's footsteps a few months later. Now, obviously, Guilford's involvement in all of this is via his marriage to Lady Jane Grey. When Queen Mary takes over and, you know, she makes it very clear that she has no intention to go through the execution of Jane and Guilford and that they will eventually be pardoned, when White's Rebellion breaks out and Mary's Mary feels like her hand is forced into authorising Jane's execution, why does she also go through with Guildford's execution? Because ultimately, you know, Jane has royal blood. Jane was the person put on the throne. What do you think it was that, Ma that Mary decided she had to also execute Guildford in the end? It's a great question. I, I think it reinforces the suggestion that I certainly try to make, which is that Guilford should be acknowledged as a royal consort um, in the line of royal consorts in, in history, um, that he was seen uh, as a ruler, um, even if only for a brief time, um, but he was acknowledged by the council, foreign ambassadors acknowledged him as King of England. Um, and I think it's, it's that, that means that he has to he has to go as well. Um, he he had been convicted of treason um, months earlier alongside his brothers, um, and and Mary had been fairly merciful in in not doing away with all of them to begin with. Um, but the, Wyatt's rebellion was calling for both of them to be reinstated um, as as monarchs. 
Uh, and if she had allowed Guilford to live, he, he just would have become another sort of rallying point figurehead for resistance um, because he had been King of England. I totally agree with you about his position that he should be acknowledged as a consort in fact so i'm uh, i'm now in the process of writing my second book and my second book is about the history of the royal consort and i'm going from edith of wessex right through to philip of spain and telling the story of each in order and guildford has a chapter thank you <laughs> I'm, I'm glad i'm glad to hear that there, there was a book not that long ago i sort of edited a collection on on consorts and I said oh I'll write the Guilford chapter and they said well there isn't going to be a Guilford chapter and I went what <laughs> he's getting he's getting a chapter just the same as everybody else's absolutely Gosh, I'm, I'm pleased I'm pleased to hear it thank you <laughs> justice for Guilford <laughs> <laughs> justice for Guilford yeah bless him I mean I also wasn't it Guilford Dudley's execution where the men, the, 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 some of the people that gathered to meet him were shaking his hands and sort of, he was, it, there was real sadness about when he went to his death, I seem to recall. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's absolutely the case. I mean, he, he was still fairly young. He was, we think, about 17. Mm. Um, he has been King of England. Um, and I think he was generally well-liked. Um, I mean, again, I, I think fiction drama tends to present him as this weird sort of whiny rat <laughs> um, running around Queen Jane. Um, there isn't, we don't know that much about him, um, but he would have been well-educated. Uh, he would have been um, part of, of the court, even as, as a, a young man. Um, and there was every reason for people to admire him at the time um and like jane he was seen as a, a victim of a catholic regime by those who still held reformist beliefs so you mentioned a moment ago about the fact that all of the dudley boys are imprisoned in the tower of london so what became of those those other brothers during the reign of queen mary so we have robert dudley but obviously there's also ambrose so what happened for the rest of mary's reign so there are five brothers imprisoned. Um, John is, is the eldest, named for his father. Um, he dies not that long after Guilford. Um, he uh, falls ill in the tower in October of, of the same year in which Guilford is, is killed and dies um, three days later. He's, he's released to die in his, his sister's home. Um, and that leaves three of them. Um, Ambrose becomes the eldest at that point. And then there's there's Robert and then uh, a younger brother, Henry. Um, it's, again, here we go, largely thanks to the work of their mother um, that they are released. Um, she and her daughters and daughters-in-law essentially take to the court, start making allies, especially amongst the new Spanish court brought over by Philip II. Philip II is um, wildly unpopular, as Wyatt's Rebellion will attest. Um, as well as mm. all the, the Spaniards he brings with him. Um, one reports that there's hardly a day goes by without a bit of knife work between the Spanish and the English in the court. Uh, so Philip needs English noble allies, and the Dudleys can do that. Um, it's, it's suggested, and I think almost certainly the case, that even before he comes over and, and marries Queen Mary, uh, Henry Sidney, who is married to Mary Dudley Sidney, convinces him that one of the things he should do when he gets over there is is free the Dudley men and and use them. Um, and and this is very much a policy of of Jane Dudley. Uh, and in her will, she's giving gifts to to Spaniards and and other allies um, to to help protect her children. And and so they're released. Um, very much thanks to, to the work that she does and um, their, their sisters and wives do. Uh, and they're deployed um, into the court as allies of Philip II. Robert later calls Philip the, the savior of the Dudley family. He attributes their salvation to Philip II. And they go to war um, to support Philip. Uh, in, in France. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the only the elder two, Ambrose and Robert, return. So, so of all those sons born 
to to John and Jane. Only Ambrose and Robert will remain um, by the time uh, Mary the First dies and Elizabeth the First comes to the throne. So, I mean, the most famous member of the Dudley family is obviously undoubtedly Robert Dudley, and it's kind of a strange one, isn't it? Because he's almost viewed. He's he's kind of viewed as a quite like a lovable rogue, I think, in many respects. He's quite he seems he's quite a likable character. You know, he's he's sort of positioned as a bit of a hunk. Um and this all stems from the fact that he is known to history as the great favourite of Elizabeth the First. So how did they did they know each other? Have they known each other from childhood and sort of grown up together? Well, Robert later, later claims um that he known Elizabeth since she was seven, and it was to him that she declared that she'd never marry at that age. But he would say that, wouldn't he? Um, and especially, especially when being presented with, oh well, you know, she's not married to you, has she? And oh well, you know, I knew her way back, and she said she'd never marry. Um, they they would have encountered each other. Um, Robert's father being as important as he was in the court of Edward the Sixth. Um, they, they would have seen each other at various court events, but Elizabeth outranked him so phenomenally <laughs> um, that, you know, to, to talk about becoming Elizabeth again, the idea that they were hunting together and, you know, just hanging out and things like that is deeply unlikely, um, as well as the idea that they had some sort of romance in the tower. Deeply unlikely. You're bursting bubbles here. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. Fiction is great. Please enjoy your fiction. <laughs> Um, but <laughs> I'm here to ruin it. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's unlikely. Um, certainly uh, in the months before she came to the throne, Robert seems to have been funding her, um, somewhat ironically out of the lands of his wife, Amy Robsart. Uh, <laughs> uh, and when she comes to the throne, she it, it appears that she's the one who adds his name to the list of people who should be notified and, and called to her court. Um, William Cecil is not so keen and wants him in France. Um, <laughs> instead, she makes a master of the horse uh, and he's always there. Um, so it's it's we, we can't pinpoint a, a moment. and I don't think we can write this this history from childhood between them. That's what existed between Robert's parents, um, but I don't think we can we can locate it for for Robert and Elizabeth. Um, but certainly on the day of her coronation, we have the the image. There's, there's these fantastic drawings of her coronation, and he is right there, um, riding just behind her, as is Ambrose. So you mentioned he was her master of horse. Did he perform any other duties for Elizabeth throughout what would turn out to be a very long reign? Is that is that an innuendo question? <laughs> <Or is> that... <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 not at all. No, just, you know, what other... Obviously, he became the Earl of Leicester. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, did, did he have did he have other genuine jobs that he did for the Queen? Yeah, there, there, were, there were various, uh, uh, you know, he was tasked with various things. Um, there's a tendency um, for her not to want him out of her sight. Um, so there's talk, for instance, that he might lead the English army in Le Havre um, in the 1560s. That goes to Ambrose. Well, I actually think it was always going to be Ambrose, um, really. He is the more military of, of the two. Um, but it also very well may have been because Elizabeth didn't want him to go. Um, and so there's there's this tendency where she's going to assign him something and then kind of pulls, pulls him back, back in. Um, there's the similar thing happens with Mary Queen of Scots. Of course, there's this talk that he's he's going to be sent to marry Mary Queen of Scots, uh, which appears to be just a great joke between Elizabeth and Mary. Um, Mary in particular finds it hilarious um, and and thinks that wouldn't it be great if both she and Elizabeth could marry a Dudley? Um, except Elizabeth would surely want Robert, and Ambrose is just not that good looking. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so the great shock of the ambassadors listening to her say all this. Um, yeah, so, so, uh, and then of course um, we get to the sort of um, later part of, of the reign, and um, he is going uh, to the Netherlands and leading the English army there, uh, which of course is a great disaster. Uh, so generally speaking, he kind of just hangs around the court 
um, and commissions a very many uh, portraits of himself. He commissions uh, a portrait on average every 18 months of himself. Wow. Um, well, well, he's actually <laughs> quite a vain man then. Yeah. Uh, well, he was he was genuinely a hunk and thought so. <laughs> I know that he also almost bankrupted himself trying to put on entertainments for Elizabeth when she visited. Yes, he spends an inordinate amount of money on particularly the 1575 Kenilworth celebrations, um, which are seen as this last great attempt to convince Elizabeth to marry him. So he is, he's very extravagant um, when he dies. He, he leaves his widow very, very much in debt. Yeah. I mean, it's one of the great what-ifs about history, isn't it, I think, with Elizabeth and, and Robert Dudley. Had she, not beca- had she not been who she was and just been simple Elizabeth, do you think they would have married? Oh, I mean, if we're really going to play out this counterfactual, he probably would have still been married to Amy Robsart, and then we have to decide whether or not she was done away with. <laughs> um, I mean, I think what lies at the heart of that question is, um, was there a real romantic affection between them? Um, and and I think yeah, there was. There love there? Um, don't ask me if it was ever consummated or anything else. I don't know. Um, but both of their actions and particularly in many ways elizabeth's demonstrate um that that feeling um and and we only have to look i think to the last letter that he sends her right before his death and that she keeps it and has marked it in her own handwriting his last letter and she keeps it by her bedside yeah i was going to mention that it's really touching isn't it that tells you i think a lot about how she felt about him yeah yeah and, and that he always bounces back, right? No matter how angry she gets. And she gets really justifiably angry at him. Um, and yeah. he's always forgiven. He's always brought back. Um, I think the, the, what happens in the Netherlands is a great example of that. You know, he, he essentially becomes sovereign of the Netherlands um, without her permission. Um, and uh, she's she angry about it. Um, and he tries various strategies, throwing people under the bus and, and so on. And finally, um, sends someone to ask her permission to send over her physician because he's so ill. And that's what does it. That's she, she softens, um, with the thought of, of what well, he might die over there. Um, and, and, and that's what allows her to sort of, what allows him to get back into her good graces and, and what prompts her to, to forgive him. Um, yeah, there's something there. Yeah, I, I definitely think there there would have been there was something there. I think that that the the evidence of yeah. that last letter in particular, I think, is is just that tells you a lot. I think so. The end of your book explores the fascinating and little known story of a woman, Alice Dudley, not born a Dudley. She marries a Dudley, but she goes on to possess the title of Duchess Dudley in her own right. Obviously women having titles in their own right was incredibly rare then as it is now. So how and why did this happen to this, this woman who was who married a Dudley, but ends up becoming a Duchess Dudley in her own right? Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating one. I barely touch on it and, and really it could become a book of, of its own. Um, when Robert Dudley or Lester dies, he leaves sort of three Roberts <laughs> to fight over his inheritance. They weren't very original, were they, with their names? <laughs> well, it was, it, you know, you name people in hopes that they'll give you money. <laughs> and Robert was was, was yeah. fairly rich. Um, so one of them is, is his own illegitimate son, um, also named Robert Dudley, um, who is, uh, is a bit of a scamp. Um, he tries to circumnavigate the globe, doesn't really work. Um, he uh, spends much of his life trying to make an argument for his own legitimacy. Probably wasn't. Um, and when that doesn't really go the way he wants, he leaves his wife, Alice, and runs off with his cousin, his younger, his much younger than him cousin, uh, to Italy and marries her. Um, and they proceed to have, I think it's like 16 children um in italy um which is where you get the fantastically named cosimo dudley and various other iterations um 
Uh, and from Italy, he, he continues to try to make the argument um, for his own legitimacy. Um, and, well, I think it's a, is it a Holy Roman Emperor or somebody names him Duke of Northumberland, um, but from outside of England. So he's not really Duke of Northumberland. Somebody just gives him that title. Um, meanwhile, um, the civil English Civil War is, is going on. Um, and uh, it, it gets very caught up in the politics of, of all of that. Um, but essentially, he, he dies in Italy. Um, and it's at the Restoration that Alice gets this title of, of Duchess Studley. Um, because she's faithful. <laughs> she remains. Um, she's loyal. And she doesn't have any children, so it's, there's no concern about the title continuing. Um, it's just this fantastic reward she gets for persevering. Um, and I ended the book with that um, in some way in, in, in recognition of, of the role that the women have played in the Dudley family throughout its its history. Um, there's a little full circle sort of moment. Yeah, yeah. Alice, Alice is rewarded with Duchess Dudley in the way that I think all the women of the, the Dudley family should have been in some way. Um, and so, yeah, it's, 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 it's a fascinating, scandalous little story. And um, yeah, I just think she's really interesting, Duchess Dudley. And she was given this title personally by Charles I, right? Yeah, it's, um, it's an attempt from Charles I to try to shore up allies right before he's killed. So, yes. Well, final question then. Um, what do you think is the Dudleys' great legacy that they left behind? You know, this is a family that had execution following them, but is that their is that their legacy? What would you say is is their their true legacy? I think to to many people's minds that has become their legacy. Um, and as I said, that's what interested me first in them. But I think in many ways the leg legacy of the Dudley family is the legacy of the Tudor period, uh, every Tudor monarch had a relationship with the Dudley, either crushing them uh, for their own gain or raising them up and, and ruling in a sense beside them. Um, we get so much of what we associate with the Tudor period from the Dudleys, whether, well, really the, the fact that there is a Tudor dynasty at all, that's, that's built on that first peaceful transition of power from Henry the Seventh to Henry the Eighth, and and that's that's only made possible with the work, the morally dubious work, of of Edmund Dudley. Um, we can look. We I talked about the navy, um, <clears throat> uh, the patronage of art. I mean, Shakespeare is is thrown in there. He has all sorts of associations um, with the Dudleys through Warwickshire, as well. Um, we've talked about the Reformation. Uh, we've talked about the fact that Elizabeth doesn't marry um, in some part, at least, because she can't marry the one man she may have wanted to, Robert. Um, so, so much of what we associate with the Tudor period really comes from this intertwining of, of these two houses, um, Tudor and, and Dudley. And so I, I'd like to hope, at least, that uh, through the work that, that I've done on this family and, and through this book, we start to see them as an integral part of the Tudor period. Which I absolutely think is the case. I think, like you say, it's the fact that they saw it all in one way or another. And that is is pretty astonishing, really. So, yeah, well, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. That was a great uh, discussion. I think people are going to be really, really interested to, to hear what you've had to say. And thank you again. Thank you. It's always fun to, to chat about the Dudleys. And so that brings us to the end of this week's episode of the Tudor Chess podcast. My thanks to the amazing Dr. Joanne Paul for joining the show and sharing the stories of the Dudley family with us. Joanne's book, The House of Dudley, from which we base the conversation around today, is available via all usual book outlets, Amazon, Waterstones, etc. A reminder again that I also release a weekly bonus subscriber episode which can be accessed via Patreon or Apple Podcasts. Thank you again for your support of the Tudor Chest and speak soon.